Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandy. Today we're going to be taking up, and tomorrow, the lessons on Leah Learns to Rest. What does it mean? Leah, who had problems in her life, finally learned to rest in the Lord. How about you? Are you resting in God? Let's go to the Word of God together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hi, and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. Great to have you here today. We got a good one today. I don't know if it's going to be just today or tomorrow, both. I don't really know, but we will see what happens as I get into this. While you're finding Hebrews chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, I have a book that this is taken out of called Why Did This Happen? What, what Happened? And basically, that's what the subject of the book is. And we're going to talk about looking at life circumstances when we stand in faith and then basically say, How did this happen? How did this come to pass? And so we're going to start talking about this here in just a moment. But in the meantime, while you're finding Hebrews chapter 3, uh, I just want you to understand that I appreciate those of you who are watching, those of you who have been watching for some time, and all those this is your first time to watch, welcome to the broadcast. I'm sure you'll love the Word of God. And uh, also, for those who are partners with me, after you listen for a while, listen today, listen tomorrow, listen for a week or so, and you decide, I like this guy. I'd like you to become a partner with me. And so if you would, uh, go to my website, bobyandian.com, and you'll find a place there where you can become a partner with those hundreds who are with me as partners in this ministry. I thank you in advance for joining me. All right, Hebrews chapter three says this in verses 18 and 19, speaking to the Hebrews about the generation that was in the wilderness. And here Paul says, to whom did he swear that they would not enter into his rest? That was into Canaan, but to those who did not obey. So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief and what caused them not to enter in. They didn't enter into rest. This is what the subject of Hebrews chapter 3 and Hebrews chapter 4 is. You know, when we talk about trusting God for something, the first thing we have to start thinking about is, let me find some scripture on that. Let's just say that you want uh, some finances in your life. So, you know, you go find scripture. There's tons of scripture on the balance of prosperity and God wanting to supply your need and what you need to do. So you find those scriptures, you line them up and say, Father, I have need of this much. I'm going to present this to you. You promised in your word you would give it to me. And so you pray and you trust God. According to uh, Mark chapter 11, verse 23 and 24, you pray in faith. You said, Lord, I trust your word more than what I see. I don't see the money right now, but you know what, Lord? Your, your word says it's going to come to pass. So what's going to come to pass is the finances will be there. And I'm going to give you all the glory until then and even after that. And then all of a sudden, you know, about maybe a week or so later, you start to say, well, Lord, it hadn't come yet. In fact, in fact, my, my situation's worse. And you start to look at those things. And I just want to kind of give you the order order of what God wants you to do. Number one is you do find the promises of God. That's important. Next of all, you pray and put your faith and trust in God. From that time on, you simply, it's like you've planted a seed and what you're supposed to do is give God praise and honor and glory. Every time it comes to your mind, you praise him for what he's doing. And there finally comes a time when you just enter into rest. And when you enter into rest, you quit obsessing over the time that has passed. You quit obsessing over seemingly contradictory circumstances to what you pray. You realize something, the word is more important and is more real than the circumstances going on around me. Circumstances change, but God's word will read the same way a hundred years from now. You live by faith in God and you switch to praise instead of griping. Instead of griping to God every day and bringing him up to date on the circumstances of which God might go, I never knew that. No, he knows everything. Instead of bringing him up to date on the circumstances and griping all the time, you begin to live by faith and now you switch to praise. You think about your problem, you just praise God that he has it and it's in his hands. You found the promises, you prayed in faith, you put the results and timing into God's hands. Now leave them there. Don't keep Keep pulling them out of God's hands. And what God is simply saying, when you learn to rest in me, you can get back to life. You've got a life to live. You've got a call to fulfill on your life. You have people to witness to. You have a job to do. You have a family to take care of. Just get back to that and leave this in God's hands. You've put it in God's hands and it's not going to help by pulling it back out. And like digging up seed every day and taking a look at it, you'll destroy what's supposed to happen. The next chapter of Hebrews says this in verse 2, verse 3, verse 9 and 10. Verse 2 and 3, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as unto them. This is the wilderness generation. 
same promise, same gospel preached to them to us, but the word which they heard did not profit them. They didn't mix it with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter into rest. One of the greatest displays of faith is to enter into rest. That is your outward show to people and literally your outward show to yourself that you have truly trusted God. You enter into rest. Verse nine goes on to say, so there remains a rest for the people of God. In other words, it's still a problem today. It wasn't just a problem back there. It's a problem today too. So there remains until this day, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered into God's rest has himself also ceased from his own works as God did from his. Unbelief is trying to solve the problem yourself, not really trusting God. Rest is an outward testimony, a display to others and to you yourself that you really have believed that God is in control. Jesus slept on a pillow in a ship while his disciples fell apart. And you know what? Jesus gave them a promise before they ever left the shore, let us pass over to the other side. He didn't say, let us try to pass over. He didn't say, let's go halfway and sink. No, he said, let us, and that's all of us, pass over to the other side. Look at what a short scripture, a short promise, a short sentence, but everything is contained in there. We're going to make it. He didn't say, let's go halfway and a storm is going to come up and we're all going to go under. Although they did go halfway and a storm broke out, but Jesus was asleep in the ship. On And Jesus again at that time told them this, and then Jesus went to sleep. They all were awake. And when the storm came, the water started splashing into the ship. The ship started filling up with water and they went back and woke up Jesus and said, don't you care that we perish? First of all, what a terrible thing to say to Jesus, don't you care? Man, he cared so much he came to earth to die for them. He cared so much he fed them. They just came from an experience where he multiplied loaves and fishes and also gave them promises all day long and a teaching from the word of God. So now in the midst of that, they wake him up and say, don't you care that we perish? Oh, Jesus woke up all right. And Jesus even calmed the storm, but he chewed them out. You know, I would think the highest form of faith is to calm the storm. No, the highest form of faith that Jesus was showing them was to sleep through the storm. The fact that he could rest and they were falling apart and Jesus woke up and calmed the storm. But I'm here to tell you, if they never woke him up, you know what their best thing they could have done was? Look at Jesus, he's asleep. Why don't we go to sleep? Why don't we lay down? This ship is gonna get to the other side because he promised it would. No, they looked at circumstances above the word and rest looks at word above the circumstances. Did you know in the Bible, there are over 7,000 promises given to believers, promises we can rest on. I like to think of it this way. In the word of God, there are over 7,000 pillows. I mean, everyone, everyone from many are the afflictions of the righteous. The Lord delivers him out of them all, uh, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your... We could go down the list, 7,000 at the last count that I've heard. I just think they're still counting. Pillows, promises we can rest on. In other words, the best thing that can happen is when a storm breaks out for us to take a promise of God, fluff it up, lay down and go to sleep on it. That has to be the biggest insult to the devil because it was a demonic storm at that time. Jesus woke up and calmed the storm. He spoke to it and commanded it to stand still. So it wasn't just a natural storm. It was a supernatural storm. And so again, what I've usually found when people come and they oftentimes tell me these stories, they don't give me all the facts. And so instead of resting on the word of God and truly trusting God, they come to me and they want to present why theirs is a special case. Oh, I know the Lord said this, but listen, let me tell you how bad my situation is. God didn't say it will work until the year 2000 something and 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 uh, Bill Watson's going to get into it. Uh, oops, it's not going to work for him. No, no, he never said that because why? His word lasts forever, abides forever, is powerful all the time. After pastoring for many years, I've learned you can't always find a cookie cutter answer to every problem. I'm giving you these promises, but understand they bend around every person's circumstances, but the promises still don't change. They'll work for um, marriage situations. They'll work for financial situations. They'll work for healing. They will work for job situations. I mean, anything in life, these things will work. But in other words, the promise is adaptable to your problem. Most people 
presenting a problem usually don't give you all the details. There's a woman that came to me one time, and I've used this story before. She came to me and just told me, I mean, she just dumped on me about how bad her husband was. After about 10 minutes, I thought, this guy's an ogre. I mean, he so mistreats her and everything. And so I, and so she said something, but what do you think I ought to do? I said, bring him in, let's talk to him. Well, I don't know if I, she said, he won't, he'll, he'll, he'll gripe and come, and I said, bring him in, let's talk to him. So he came in, I mean, after 10 minutes with him, I was completely shocked. I thought, this guy isn't a thing like she said. And the things she would, had told me, I brought him up to him. He says, no, no, honey, look at her and tell her. And she went, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. And I began to get the idea, man, it's good to talk to the other side. It's good to find out what the other one is telling. And so again, God conceals stories on his side for a reason because he knows everything. But we often need to go investigate situations and so I did. And in that case, it ended up, you know, the marriage worked out and everything, but she had to concede before him and, you know, that he really wasn't as bad. I mean, she was just wanting out so bad and she, certain things about him she didn't like, and she wasn't willing to try to work with him or him work with her. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse two says, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter the glory of God to conceal a matter. What, God doesn't tell you all the details about what's going on. He gives you a word of knowledge. He doesn't give you all knowledge. He gives you a word of his knowledge. He gives you a word of wisdom. He doesn't give you all wisdom, but a little piece of wisdom just for you. But there's times when God conceals most everything. Why? Because he knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's gonna happen. God is omniscient. He knows everything. So that verse in Proverbs 2, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It goes on to say after that though, but the the uh, glory of a man is to search out a situation. The glory of a king is to search out a situation. And so it comes back to us that we're not God. So we don't know everything going on. And the best thing we can do is go and look behind the scenes and see what's really going on. Find out what the true situation is and investigate it. And once you have as much facts as possible, then you can make a decision. In other words, there's this old expression that comes back from the West and that is don't run off half cocked. Half cock simply means you've got the thing and you've already pulled the thing back and you can easily shoot somebody. I mean, you could easily set that gun off. So don't run off half cock. Go find out all the things first before you take your first shot. So in the story I'm gonna be talking about, this is in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. And uh, we would never know all the true story behind David and Bathsheba if the Holy Spirit hadn't put it in chapter 11. If we just came to chapter 12 and that baby died that was uh, born to he and Bathsheba, then we might look at that and say, oh, what a terrible situation. I wonder how this thing, oh, and we would have gone into all types of suppositions. But in chapter 11, God gave us the background on it. What happened was again with David and Bathsheba is that David was supposed supposed to go to battle. Chapter 11 said this, but he didn't. He stayed at home. And he should have been at battle fighting with the, with the troops, but he just decided to stay home this day. Probably had some spiritual excuses. I mean, he told his commanders as they went out, listen, I, I just feel like I need to catch up on my prayer time and my study time. And guys, you know, you guys are just so good. You go to battle, I'm going to stay here. Well, the Bible says that he, in, the, in the evening, he got out of bed. Notice this, in the evening, he got out of bed. He'd been sleeping all day long. He was bored out of his brain. And so this is what really got him to all the trouble. And this is what, again, brought chapter 12 on where there was some discipline that was brought toward David. When we come back from the break, we'll talk about this, but there's really a story I wanna bring up with Jacob and Leah. And this is what's gonna bring around some great revelation to you about the importance of learning to rest on the promises of God. See you right after halftime. What happens if we've prayed, but it seems like God isn't answering? Or if we are believing God for someone's healing, but their condition is getting worse? Worse yet, what if tragedy has already struck? Like the loss of a loved one, a failed marriage, or ruined business. We may begin to wonder, was it my fault? I prayed, but didn't receive an answer. At times we don't know for sure why something has happened, but God has promised He will answer. He simply tells us to return to what we know. He has not brought us this far to abandon us. In Why Did This Happen? Bob Yandian outlines the biblical steps to overcoming tragedy and what to do when we don't understand why something hasn't happened. We can take hope, strength, and confidence, knowing that God's word and plan for our life will not fail if we get up and begin moving forward again. To order Why Did This Happen? Visit our website at bobyandian.com. 
Theology Simplified. This is a class I teach at Karis Bible College, and it's my favorite class. I think the students' favorite class is there. And I've been waiting to put this into a book. It's eight different theological terms that sound difficult, but actually are very simple. I just simply think the Bible sometimes is filled with complicated sounding words, but you break it down, it becomes very simple. This book is called Theology Simplified. Let me tell you what all it covers. It covers predestination. It covers reconciliation and sanctification. It covers glorification, justification. Redemption, propitiation, and election are all covered in this book. And again, big words with simple meanings. I bring it down to you. When I used to pastor at the church, I would even tell, I'd say, housewives, you that are listening out there today in the congregation, this is designed for you too. The Word of God is not difficult. Go to my website, bobtheandian.com. You'll find how you can have a copy for yourself. Blessings upon blessings to you. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on partnership. Again, in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12, we have the story of David and Bathsheba, but chapter 11 really sets the story behind the story. You know what's interesting about chapter 11? No one else knew this was going on. The public didn't know it. The prophets didn't know it. The military didn't know it. Just David and Bathsheba knew what happened. David stayed at home in chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, didn't go to battle. And really all it starts out was he was geographically out of God's will. He was supposed to be in rabbi fighting, but he stayed at home. And while he stayed at home, I, you know, he probably told everybody how important of a day it was going to be. I'm going to pray. I feel a psalm coming on. So maybe I, you know, I'm going to stay at home today. And he ended up sleeping all day long. He was bored out of his mind, wandered around the outside of his house and saw Bathsheba bathing naked outdoors. You're probably your first thought is that woman. What a terrible woman. No, she didn't know any. There were men at home. The men that were at home were out at the gates guarding the city and everyone else was at battle. She didn't know the king stayed home and saw her. He called her into his house and had sex with her. You say, well, why would she have sex with him? Well, it's the king. The king's asking, so she gives herself to the king. She goes home, finds out she's pregnant, let him know she's pregnant. And what does he do? Instead of getting it right with her husband and getting it right with God and getting it right with the military, he stayed there and tried to cover it up and ended up murdering her husband. And so by the end of chapter 11, he's in all this mess and he brings her in and makes her his wife. I'm sure the women in town went nuts. <gasps> David is so wonderful. This is one of his best fighters and look at he got killed in battle. And the wife was pregnant before he went into battle and David has brought her in and married her and he's going to adopt that child as his own. I mean, there's probably, and they probably put how wonderful a king he was and they didn't know the sin that was behind the scene. The public didn't know it, but the Holy Spirit told us in 2 Samuel chapter 11, see the difference when you know the circumstances and that's why it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. He knows everything behind the scenes. We don't, so we're always trying to straighten out God Tell him what the situation really is when he knows the whole issue. It was the same way with Elijah hiding in the cave. The public never saw these wide emotional swings in the prophet of God that was all calling down fire one minute, running from the queen the next minute, and then calling God names and even blaming God for his situation. Moses struck the rock. He died and the people didn't even know why. God told him he's going to take you in the promised land. And just when they got to the edge of the promised land, Moses dies and it turns it over to Joshua. I'm sure the people are wondering what's going on, but God told us the story behind the scenes. And that's what the word of God does. Now, God doesn't tell us everything in the word of God, but simply enough to let us know, trust God, trust God with your circumstances and he will take care of them. And there's going to be things you don't know, but you know what? You'll understand in heaven. When you do understand in heaven, you're going to go, oh, that was it. 
You didn't need to know. You'll find out again by leaving it in God's hands. He knows he'll better take better care of you. And so it was with Jacob and Leah. I mentioned this before the break. And with Jacob and Leah, we come back to a situation where people didn't see what was going on behind the scenes. But God's gonna just take us right into the middle of a story and help us to understand the importance of resting on the promises of God. Even their friends didn't know the story behind their marriage. Jacob saw the most beautiful woman he had ever seen named Rachel, the daughter of his boss, Laban. And Laban said, you can have Rachel if you'll work for me for seven years. So Jacob worked for seven years. And when the wedding took place and here came the bride down the aisle. And I mean, you know, I'm sure the moment he threw back the veil, he found out it wasn't Rachel. It was her sister, Leah. And for the list, what happened was it seemed like the gene pool simply gave Rachel all the good looks and Leah did not get the good looks. In fact, the, there's different uses of the word for Leah as far as the definition of the Hebrew. One of them is cow eyes. I mean, she just was not pretty at all. And when he saw what happened, he was very angry. And he went back to his boss and said, you promised me this. He said, I decided not to do it. You want my daughter, Rachel? You're gonna have to work for seven more years. But here's what Jacob did. Jacob during that time did not want him to have Rachel. Rachel was his prize. She was the good looking one. She won all the beauty contests. I mean, she was so popular and he was waiting for some football player to come, some rich businessman to come. But here's the way he could get the, the other daughter out of the way was simply substitute her into the wedding and then make the next seven years beyond that working for Rachel hell for Jacob. He made it terrible for him. When the time came, Laban substituted his other daughter again, Leah, into the ceremony. And this was Laban's one chance to marry off Leah. Leah also knew it, and this was her only chance to marry. So Jacob didn't know until after the wedding, he married the more homely looking daughter of his boss. He then found out he would have to work seven more years to marry the more beautiful Rachel, and Laban never planned to give Rachel to Jacob. Jacob was willing to wait seven more years, so Laban cheated Jacob, lowered his salary 10 times, trying to get him to quit and Jacob still didn't give up. Jacob was obsessed with marrying Rachel. I mean, I'm sure he and, and, and Leah would be on the streets and she's having children. So they're probably pushing their children down the street. And he looks over the store and here comes Rachel walking out. And I'm sure Leah looked at him as he saw Rachel and she saw that look in his eyes like, oh my God, she, he still loves my sister and he doesn't love me. I'm sure she was rejected by her dad, sold off, cheated to get her to marry Jacob. And now that she's married to Jacob, Jacob doesn't love and she really feels like she's ostracized on the outside. So again, Laban cheated Jacob, lowered his salary 10 times, but Jacob still did not give up. After Leah married Jacob, she lived with the fact that she had been used by her father as a trick to marry Jacob. She also knew Jacob was stuck with her and did not love her. And Jacob still longed every day for Leah's sister, Rachel. Leah lived in jealousy constantly of Rachel. Now she faced a possible future that if her husband did not give up, would work for almost nothing to get Rachel, she was faced with a future problem that Rachel for the rest of her life, she there would be two sisters having the same husband and the two sisters hated each other and the husband loved one wife over the other. Leah was blessed in one area. She could have kids. She gave birth to many boys for Jacob. In fact, the mark of a good wife in this part of the world and at that time was to have many sons as a heritage. So let's go to the story behind the story, the one the friends didn't see because as far as they could see, you know, here was Jacob and here was Leah and look at all these boys. They thought God was pouring out blessing on this marriage and they didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. In Genesis chapter 29, let's take a look at verses 31 through 35. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son and called his name Reuben. For she said, the Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. So she conceived again, bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he will therefore has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. She conceived again and bore a son. Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore she called him Levi. She conceived again and bore a son and said, now I will praise the Lord. So she called his name Judah. Then she stopped bearing. Leah had four sons in a short period of time. 
To their friends, it looked like a great outpouring of God's favor on the marriage of Leah and Jacob. It looked like Jacob loved Leah, but he really didn't. Their friends didn't know the story behind the story. But the real story was that Leah was having children to try to win the love of her husband. Each son brought new hope that Jacob would now love her, yet all she brought on herself was more responsibility to raise and take care of another child. And Jacob also only thought of Rachel and lived for the day he could marry her. What Leah thought would bring happiness into their marriage only brought more despair. Leah's problem was spiritual. Leah tried to win her husband's love by works. She was not responsible for the problems, but she was also not responsible for the answer. It was up to the Lord. What I got into, I couldn't help my looks. I can't help how my husband feels toward me right now. But you know what? I got into this thing and now the Lord can get me out. Only the Lord. And she, what she didn't fall back on at that moment was the love of the Lord until finally that this last son was born, the fourth one, and this one that was born was Judah. That's again, the name means praise. And what Leah thought would bring happiness in their marriage only brought more despair. But now she was not going to be responsible for the problem. She was going to not also be responsible for the answer. She was going to turn it over to the Lord. How often do we forget that? We're not responsible for the problem. They were thrown at us. And so if we're not responsible for the problem. We're not responsible for the answer. That's the Lord turning it over to the Lord. So it was up to the Lord who only only can turn cursing into blessing. We can't do that. We can trust him, but we cannot change the situation around. We've all been placed into situations we didn't like, but the way out is not by trying to solve it with our own efforts, and this is exactly what Leah did. This is the time to turn the situation over to the Lord, put your faith in God's promises, and watch him bring answers and peace into your despair. Isaiah 40, 31, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. So so finally, Leah learned to rest. Leah finally got the message. And with the fourth son, Judah, when he was born, she said, now I will praise the Lord. Oh, that's the best thing to do. One of the greatest displays of rest is to give God praise. After all, this is what the name Judah meant. You can't worry when you praise God. Praise looks backward and forward at the same time. It brings back memories, how God met your past problems, but it also gives faith to solve your problems in the days to come. Praise is a display that you are resting on God's promises. We stand in a long line of people who've had problems, many worse than ours, and God delivered them. God split the Red Sea for Israel. You've never had to go through a Red Sea. He brought water out of a rock. You've never had faced that problem. These are huge problems that God provided for them. He can certainly provide for you. And he provided bread in a desert for 40 years. Leah finally realized that when Judah was born and she put her life and marriage back into God's hands, anyone who really puts faith in God enters into rest. And she finally learned to rest, but only for a while. We're going to have to get into this one tomorrow. Finding out that she rested in God, but something came up and still it really took her attention back off of God, onto her problem again, onto her sister's problem and onto her husband's problem. And we're going to find out finally at the end, she really learned to trust in God, rest in God, and oh, did God bless her life. I'm here to tell you the same thing is true for you. Why don't you take your problems today and hand them totally over to the Lord Jesus Christ and realize if I really trust God, I'll rest in him. His promises are bigger than my problem and I can't help him by work. I can't help God by griping. I'm the only way I can help God is for me to finally rest in his promises and get back to living for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll see you tomorrow. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.